For this batch, I roasted five beef tri-tips on the top rack of the grill after marinating them for a couple hours in Basque Norte. And then I sliced them nice and thin to get them ready for freeze drying. I actually roasted six, but we ate one, so I'm not counting that one. This is one of the things that it would be good to have an extra set of trays for. So I'm going to put sliced roast beef on this for freeze drying, and that way I can pre-freeze them and see how much I can put on there. So, you know, three, four slices deep, and my plan is to have them close to those edges because the tray comes out a little bit so it's a little bit wider at the top so as long as i'm close here i should be fine so we'll get it loaded up that way and find out how much that weighs and see if i need to go thicker because that's not very thick so just trying to match up with the edge of the paper Okay, let's get a weight on that and find out where we're at. It's 54 grams less than that. So it's only a, maybe less than a pound and a half. I'll finish filling this, probably get it uh, considerably more so I can get the weight up. Then we'll come back and look at it. And it would have been a lot heavier than that before it was dry or cooked. So that's more than two and a half pounds if it were before it was cooked call that close enough we're going to be light but we're going to use that so the j bin is done uh, next we're going back to our regularly scheduled uh, freeze drying starting with roast sliced tri-tip or tri-tip that was roasted and then sliced up it's good for sandwiches and on the go it rehydrates extremely quickly because of the thin slices we have another set of the six categories of batches uh, we're running through, starting with tri-tip, and then we're going to do pick canned pickled beets as our vegetable, and then cubed strawberries again as our fruit, and then we'll continue on with the next things. And then after that, uh, because of doing six batches at a time instead of five, we have two leftover batches at the end, so batch 49 and 50. For those, we're gonna take blocks of food that we've already frozen earlier when we were prepping things for freeze drying and we made bigger batches so we have extra things. And we're going to take uh, somewhere between eight and 20 of those blocks, depending if we have half blocks or whole blocks, and freeze dry two batches just to get more things out of the freezer. Because uh, we still probably have six or eight batches beyond the 50 that are sitting in the freezer waiting to be freeze dried uh, plus many more things that just didn't make it on this list of 50. If I were going to do this for real my very first 50 batches I would probably do something very similar to what we just did except I would probably do just one or two rounds of all six categories and then go back and concentrate two or three batches in a row of the same foods basically uh, like the costco rotisserie chicken do four or five batches of Cos costco rotisserie chicken and then maybe four or five batches of some kinds of vegetables but i do like the idea of having this mixed bin to start with and having a couple of those sets already done before i go back and start doing bulk items of the same thing over and over but one of the advantages of doing the same thing over and over, if you're doing five batches, after the first couple, you would really get a feel for how long does it take to dry that item and the differences between batches. It could still be a few hours more or less for two seemingly identical batches. But it's going to be more similar than a batch of chicken and then a batch of peas. We're down to our last eight batches, so one set of the six and then the two miscellaneous ones, and we're done with the first 50. And then we'll move on from there. All right, it's had a chance to defrost after the, my sister's meals uh, batch, and so we'll get it set up for the next batch. Got the little grabber thing with the paper towel, because I could tell that there was a little droplet of water on the top, and it would still work fine. 
as well as I've got this, I might as well make sure that it is as dry as possible. Okay, I'm not seeing a lot of issues underneath. Get the thermometer underneath. And then I'll get it ready for pre-cooling. Here's the water from that last batch of the meals. So a little more than three quarters of a gallon, six and a half pounds maybe. That's the amount of water I'd like to see in a batch for the maximum. I want to make sure that I've got a seal ring all the way around and I'm missing an area here and here this time. So I'm just using my little pallet knife going in there and just twisting it very lightly like this. And that pushes out the rubber on the seal or the silicone on the seal. All right, now I have a complete ring around there. So even for pre-cooling, I like to have that ring around there so I don't end up with an icy spot on there. I'm going to start it with the customize and continue. Okay, and it's only 69 degrees, so it won't take too long to get it cold enough to put the food in. So we'll be back in a little while to get the food in. Freeze dryer's been pre-cooling now for almost an hour and it's down to about 10 degrees. So we'll get the food on the trays and get them in there. Tray one. And with this, I already have this ready. So my plan is to slide the parchment and everything on there. Whoa. Tray one, 1737. The total was well over 10 pounds before it was cooked. But of course I'll track this weight. Tray two, 1774. Tray three, 1826. And tray four, 1907. Okay, those can go in now. Okay, the freeze dryer is down to two degrees now and it's been an hour and five minutes. So we'll get them in there. Starting at the bottom with tray four. And hopefully, oh, I was afraid that that one might hit. Okay, tray three. And two. And tray one. Okay, the thermometers are all below 10 degrees still. So it stayed nice and cold. I want to make sure I get that ring all the way around. And it is already. Uh, so I know that it's well sealed and I'm not going to get ice across uh, that seal area. So uh, it's in there. It'll be done in 30, 40 hours, which since it's in the evening, it'll be two days from now. We'll see you then. I'll be right back. The slices of roast beef finished during the night. It stopped and just kept the vacuum uh, in the chamber, but the vacuum pump was off. And of course it stayed cooling all night. I didn't show the restarting of it for rewarming, but I did restart it, rewarm it, and it's been about an hour and a half. And all of the thermometers are at least 100 degrees now. When I restarted it, it had recooled. said it was negative 61 when I restarted it. And the tray thermometers showed between negative 40 and negative 50. So it was really cold. If I'd taken it out then to weigh it, um, I would have gotten condensation on the trays and on the food pretty much instantly. So I rewarmed it. Now I'm going to take it out and weigh it. I've rewarmed it more than necessary. It's, like I said, it's been an hour and a half or just about an hour and a half and probably a half hour would have been plenty. So we'll get them out, weigh them, get them back in for two hours to check to make sure that they're dry. Uh, so now it's had a total of 12 and a half hours of final dry time. And with roast beef, it tends to dry pretty quickly and pretty easily, so it's probably done. It was already up to temperature. All the, the thermometers were showing over 110 when it still had six hours of final dry to go. So now it's had seven and a half more than that. Okay, so let's get them out. I'll arrow down past the last of it. Open the drain valve.
All right. And when I put them back in, I'm going to switch the top two and the bottom two so that uh, they're on the other shelves. And you can see that's looking real good. They did shrink, and that's pretty normal for this. Uh, so we'll get that checked. Tray one, 11.05. Tray two, 11.62. Take tray two and put it up at the top. And tray one, put it down here. So tray three, 11.32. And tray four, 11.74. Good, now we'll put this one up one. So tray four, and it definitely feels the coolest and it shows 100 degrees and the others show about 120. Okay. So get the drain valve closed. I'm going to give it more dry time. I did close the drain valve, continue, and I'm going to say it's cold enough already. Get it restarted. So I gave it an extra 15 minutes, so it says 215. That way it will keep drying uh, for the full two hours before the heaters turn off. So I'll come back in two hours, we'll check the weight. If it's dry, we'll bag it. The oil is still looking nice and clean. Now the pump's running. The recirculating pump for the filter. I'll give it a little shake. There's a few little drops of water going through there. But all in all, it's quite clean still. You can see it's in the last few minutes. It means the heater's been off for a little while. The pressure's down low. The temperature still says 97. I'll arrow past the last of that to stop it. Get the drain valve opened. And we'll check the weights. So the thermometers. Okay, that one down there says about 105, 120, 125, and almost 130 for that one. Oh, nope, 110. So tray one. is 1104 so that's down by one so if that's the most we have I'm gonna call it good so tray two 1162 no change tray three and checking to make sure that it's not touching anything. 1136, that's the same, so no change on there. And tray four, 1174, and it bounced down to three, so somewhere between three and four, so it's a fraction of a gram. So I'm gonna call that good. So I'm going to stop it with no defrost. Make it so much quieter. Pull the thermometer out from underneath. Okay. And put my little defrost baffle in. And again, this is just the way that I've been defrosting it. You can close the door and use the defrost function. Um, I'm just clipping the fan to the door uses very little power it does take longer takes two or three hours at least to defrost it um, you could also have like a you could use the shelf itself and clip a fan to a, a board for instance sticking out of of that or something i don't think i can yeah i can't grab it on anything in there itself yeah this fan i can't put it on there and i wouldn't want to grab onto the seal um, but anyway, I just find this works for me. There's probably, there's definitely different ways and there might even be better ways. 
I'll get the food rolled over to the bagging cart and then we'll come back and get the times and the power usage. Here's what we know about this. So the clock on the machine shows about 43 hours of total drying time. So the pre-freezing, the main dry cycle, and the final dry cycle. But in reality, it's a great deal less than that because it was actually probably done at 33 hours. Uh, the reason 33 hours is that's when it would have finished if I had been here to take it out originally when it said it was done. But I left it in overnight and then I had to rewarm it before I could get the weights. And then the additional two hours to check to see if it was dry. Well, that didn't change. So most likely the original amount of 33 hours and eight minutes, it was probably dry. Uh, if I want to be cautious on the outside of the range, I could add the hour and a half of the redry time, but there was no difference after that. So at the maximum I should probably put is 34 and a half hours. So that's the number I'm going to use for this. Next we'll get the power usage. That batch of sliced roast was 26.04 kilowatt hours. So I'll reset that and get it ready for the next batch. All right, all the trays of roast beef are out and we'll get the weights on them now and then get them bagged. Get the thermometers out and find out how much they lost. So I've got all the weights of the trays now. Now I'll subtract out the weight of the tray and parchment paper itself to find out what the weight of the just the meat is. So I'll get that and I'll be right back. So I've got the information so far. I've got the start date, the batch number, what it is, and the fact that it was over 12 pounds before it was cooked. Uh, when I put it on the trays, it was a little bit less than 9.4 pounds. It took 34 and a half hours to dry, 26.04 kilowatt hours of power. The gross weights before, that is just simply I'm, I'm weighing the tray and everything that's on the tray, except this is before I've put in the thermometers. I honestly don't know why I do it that way. I think it's because I've got more than one kind of thermometer and they weigh a little bit different. So if I don't include them in this weight, then I can use the same tear weight every time. And I'm using these weights uh, for each tray because I have four trays. All four trays weigh something different. The lightest tray I have weighs 742 grams with a piece of parchment paper on it. The heaviest tray weighs 755 grams with a piece of parchment paper on it. We've got a fairly decent amount. We've got a, what, a 13 gram difference from the lightest to the heaviest. That's why I use the tear weight so I can subtract out. Now that gives me the net weight as it went in. But now this dry check weights, they have no use or value for this information. I, I, it doesn't get used in any way except to tell me that the weight has stopped dropping. So it doesn't matter that the thermometer is in there or not because I'm just getting a weight as it sets on the scale at that moment in time. And then I'm looking two hours later, did it get less? And if it's significantly less, then it's not done. So the gross weight after I am taking the thermometer back out so that I can again use that same tear weight. If all of my thermometers weighed exactly the same, I could put the thermometers in first, but sometimes I don't even use a thermometer or it's just difficult to put in. So anyway, that gives me my gross weight after, then I can again subtract the tray and that gives me how much the food weighs on the tray. So in this case, it started out as 4,250 grams of the cooked beef, ended up as 1,550. And if I subtract that one from that, that gives me a water loss of 2,700 grams. 
So if I need to rehydrate it for a soup or something, I'll know how much to add. If you're just going to rehydrate this for a sandwich, you can just pour some water on it or put it in a container of water. It'll soak up what it needs and it really doesn't get over wet. So that's not really an issue. Um, but now I do have the weights in case I do want to try to rehydrate it uh, in a soup or I'm not really sure how else. Maybe chopped beef or a chili or something like that. My hope is to get it in 10 of these bags. But looking at this, I don't think it's going to fit in 10 bags. So it might be considerably more and I'll try to figure out how much will fit in there. And I'm going to put the water loss and I think I can do that just by doing the math for percentages. But I've got the batch number, what it is, the date that it went in, and I'm going to put a water loss here. So how much it lost uh, in case I need to use that for something. So oh, we'll start to find out how much they will fit. My thought for these is to use it for sandwiches like we do with the ham. So I want enough for a couple of sandwiches. So that would be an awfully big slice of bread. So I need less than half of a um, paper towel size. Wouldn't take very many. There's four little slices. So this would definitely be enough for a sandwich already. And I want to be fairly gentle with them because they're fragile uh, when they're dry. So I easily have enough for two really nice sandwiches in there already. And that's only 60, a little less than 69 grams. And I don't want to crush them or anything. And these would crush quite easy if you wanted to have a chopped uh, beef kind of thing. It'd be real easy to just crush these up right now. And that's one thing I really don't want. Well, I know I've got more than two sandwiches worth in there already. And it's 85 grams. I'm going to call that one good enough. This would make two nice sandwiches already right here. Let's see if I can just slide those right in there. Okay, and I could add enough for a little enhancement. And as it is right now, it's really good. It's just like the driest jerky you've ever had. Okay, so I went ahead and labeled one of the two quart bags so I can get these much bigger pieces in. And I guess it really doesn't matter right now how much is in each one because I'm going to put the water loss on later. But this would be, I mean, that is some really nice big slices. So four big pieces like that. I should have cut them smaller. Most of these stacks will make a, at least a really good sandwich, maybe a little bit more. And these, I will not be sucking the air out of these. I don't want to crush them. And now I've got more of the big bags for some of these bigger pieces. That way I don't have to break them up at all. Because I really didn't want to do that. With the amount of water loss that this, this beef slices had. So if I take one of these pack, and this particular one is the last one, it's the lightest. Has 59.2 grams of beef in it. And if I multiply that by 1.742, that's the weight loss that it had. So then I can say how much water it lost. This 59.2 lost 103 grams of water. So water loss of 103 grams not very neat. So it's um, almost one and three quarters times the weight of this what's in there is the water loss. So I'll do that with each one of the bags. I'll just put it on the scale 
and then multiply its weight by 1.742 and that will give me the water loss for that particular bag. And then we'll be ready for the oxygen absorbers. So 85.2 times 1.742, 148 grams. So water loss was approximately 148 grams. I'll pause here. I'll do the rest of them. I won't bore you with the rest of it. And you may never need to know that number uh, because if you're just going to rehydrate it for uh, slices for sandwich, just add some water. It'll soak up what it needs. So the only value this might have is if you were going to crumble it up and put it in a stew or a chili or something and you wanted to know how much water it was going to soak up it's going to soak up approximately that much. So that way you can adjust your recipe accordingly. Okay, so I'll be back uh, when those are done. I ended up with 13 one quart bags and three two quart bags. I added the amount of weight that it would have been before it was freeze dried by doing the calculation, uh, how much it weighs now versus how much the water loss is and then adding them together and that gives me what it was before it was freeze dried. So anyway, so now I've got how much water was lost out of it in case I need it for whatever reason for rehydrating sometime in the future, how much it weighed when it started, what it is and the batch number and the date that it went into the freeze dryer. The ones that had about around 250 grams to begin with uh, that's really plenty for two or three sandwiches. Easily two or three big sandwiches. And then these big ones. So this one ended up with a total of, before it was dried, 552 grams. So just about a pound. I didn't do the conversions on any of them. I just left it all in grams because it's just, the math is easier. So anyway, uh, so this would have been about a pound and that's enough for quite a few sandwiches or one really huge sandwich. I'm going to be using 300 cc oxygen absorbers for the quart bags and 500 cc oxygen absorbers for the two quart bags. So we'll get those in there and get them zippered shut. So this bag only had three left, so we'll get those and get them separated. Make sure I don't end up with one without an oxygen absorber. So as soon as I get it in there, I'll get it sealed. And I'm not even trying to push out any extra air on these because they're already going to shrink down by about 21% when it loses, when it absorbs the oxygen or converts the oxygen, however you want to call it. Oh. And I don't want it to crush the slices of meat. It's going to end up breaking some of them, I'm sure. So that's the sensor in there. And I already started to cut the bag. And if you watch that sensor, how fast it changes color. It already did it. It just, these are just so fast. I'm really impressed with how fast these go. Yeah, I mentioned before. The old ones took uh, 10 or 15 minutes, I think, to change. They took quite a while. Move the bag over a little bit as I do each one so that I don't forget one. And zippering them shut is no substitute for heat sealing. Okay, got those. Now the bigger bags. And with those, I've got the 500 cc oxygen absorber. For these thick bags, I've got it set for about a, a six, six and a half on the, the scale. And the first bag, I'm going to do it twice. So it's done. I'm going to do it one more to make sure that it's 100% up to temperature, um, but doesn't have to be cranked any higher. Okay, it's a beautiful seal. I've got it high at the top room for two or three more tries if this one fails or if I want to cut it off and use part of it and reseal it. When you get these bags, there's no front and back, but I like to seal every one of them with the label side up. That way, while it's sealing and I'm letting it cool for a few seconds, I can kind of look at the label and see what I screwed up and needs to be fixed. I don't care for the look of that. There's a couple of little wrinkles there. 
It might be fine because of the way it melts it and seals. I'm going to put it back on here, smooth it out. I wasn't particularly careful with that one the first time. It should have been. Anyway, I'm going to make sure it's all smoothed out and then kind of roll it over that area. That gives it a, a little bit of a stretch and makes sure that it's nice and smooth. And I hold it as I come down on there. Okay, that's good. So make sure that I have a good smooth area before I seal it down. Okay, and now the three bigger bags. And the bigger the bag, it seems like to me, like it ends up being more wavy on this top edge. And it could be just this batch of bags. Uh, because since we started using less of the bigger bags, it takes us longer to go through them to get to the next batch. So I'm going to make sure that it's really smoothed out well before I try to seal it. All right, that came out nice. I can always put another one above it if this one has a problem. That one last step that I do before I put it in the bin for storage, I'm going to write down the gross weight of the whole bag. So if it ever fails and starts letting water in, I'll know ahead of time. Or I'll, I'll know right away. So 108 grams. I'll just put 108 grams at the bottom edge. So now I've got all the information I hope I need. I've got a batch number, which I can look up in my notebook, uh, any other notes about it. Uh, what it is, the date that it went into the freeze dryer, how much it weighed before it was dried, how much water it lost, and what it weighs right now with oxygen absorber bag, everything. Okay. So, as soon as I get all the weights on these, We'll move over to the bin and get them in the bin. We're starting out a new bin, bin seven. The sliced roast beef is bagged now. Got it bagged in 13 one quart bags and three two quart bags. Uh, it's about uh, roughly half a pound and a pound uh, in the bags. So it's plenty for two or three sandwiches and maybe as much as a half dozen sandwiches for the bigger bags, depending on how thick you want your sandwich. Uh, they're going into bin seven. They're the first item in bin seven. And we're going back to one of our sets. So the next item will be vegetable again. And we're doing canned pickled beets, uh, which we'll probably give away later because canned pickled beets is not my favorite. Uh, but we were looking for something that a lot of people might like and we've done pickled beets before for people and they come out really nicely. So these will go in the bin and then move on to the next thing. Ah, the empty bin. Besides laying them down in a lot of bins, we've stood them up and then put other bags upside down between them. So you have one set of bags this way and then another set of bags this way uh, in between them all. And I'm, I'm honestly, I don't know which way is better. So whatever seems to work for you. I was just thinking about these because the roast beef, I'm concerned that it's going to get damaged. So I'm going to put a big bag on one side, then the little on the other side. So that the first item in this bin. We'll move on to the next batch as soon as the freeze dryer is defrosted and get those going. We have two leftover batches at the end. So batch 99 and 100. We have two leftover batches at the end. So batch 49 and 50.